Well, as you know, we had an extra week. I had an extra week to prepare this lesson, and so I was doing some more study. I mostly studied on the first Great Awakening um, more so than this, so I've studied pretty extensively the uh, life of uh, Asa Hell Nettleton. In fact, there was just a biography of Nettleton that was published uh, in 2012 that's the most thorough that had ever been written. And so the revival of Kentucky in the year 1800 and the Cane Ridge revival in 1801, so much of this was new to me and really interesting um, because the Bible Belt, as it came to be called, had its origin out of the revival that came at Cane Ridge, just outside of Lexington, Kentucky, in 1801. And the Great Revival of 1800 affected the whole country, but was most powerfully felt in the region extending from the Allegheny Mountains westward to the borders of civilization in the southern states. It was a series of evangelical Christian meetings which began in Logan County, Kentucky, and I'll explain why in a little bit, which ignited the subsequent events and influenced several of the leaders of the Second Great Awakening. The events represented a transition from traditions carried over from Europe to innovations that responded to the unique needs and personality of Americans in the new century. Well, Kentucky was the frontier. Kentucky was the Wild West in 1800. It had only been a state for uh, eight years. And there is a lot to this story. Um, and if I was to sum it into three heads, uh, do you remember, Al, the movie The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly? Yeah. 1966, I couldn't hardly believe that's how old that is. Clint Eastwood, and I guess you could call this these three parts of this lesson, the ugly, the good, and the bad, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but Kentucky was really the frontier. In fact, this is a picture of Daniel Boone. I had read that his son Nathan was actually the first white person that they have any record of that was born in this state. It was so occupied by Indians but McGrady was a Presbyterian pastor born in Pennsylvania, but moved to North Carolina as a boy with his parents. And he returned to Pennsylvania in the 1780s to study theology. This education was in the famous log cabin college of Presbyterian minister John McMillan. Now that's McMillan on the right in this picture. That's supposed to be James McGrady on the left, but I don't really know that there is, in fact, a picture of McGrady. I don't know where they got this, and I don't know if that, in fact, is him, because they said that he was a lot more rotund. That man looks kind of skinny, and um, it's almost humorous, but at least two sources said that part of the draw to his preaching was the fact that he was so homely people would look at him and say, I wonder what a guy like this has to say. But he was, I guess the closest I could compare him to anybody would be Gilbert Tennant. Uh, because he was so fiery, he was so powerful in his appeals of heaven and hell. And um, starting in North Carolina, that record is in uh, Sketches of North Carolina by William H. Foote. And I'd heard Foote's name for the first time when Ian Murray did his series on revival, which I found out was uh, 1973, and that was Grace Church in Carlisle, where those were preached. But um, McGrady stayed for a while at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia, where a student-led revival of Mark Proportions was going on. He arrived back in North Carolina in 1790. He pastored a church there until 1796. About the year 1790, McGrady married and became the pastor of a congregation in Orange County. Here he labored with his wanted zeal and often with great success. His zeal provoked opposition. Um, the one thing that was said about Gil Gilbert Tennant in the first Great Awakening is... Uh, his sermons were so powerful and so alarming that the great orator George Whitfield himself said of Gilbert Tennant, 
that you must either be converted or enraged in hearing him. You couldn't remain indifferent. Well, this is the way that this man's preaching strikes me. His zeal provoked opposition and he was accused of distracting people from their labors and creating unnecessarily unnecessary alarm among decent and orderly people. So, there was a family that wasn't going to have anything to do with it, so they wrote a letter to him in blood requiring him to leave the country at the peril of his life and a number of wicked men and women of the baser sword on a certain occasion during the week assembled in his church tore down the seat, set fire to the pulpit, and burned it to ashes. On the following Sunday, when the congregation met for worship, a scene of confusion and desolation presented itself. He, however, proceeded with the service, using a relevant and solemn psalm and delivering a sermon from the following text, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stones them which are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together, even as the hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. He was totally unaffected by it. It caused him no consternation, whatever, and eventually the family that was causing all of the trouble left, and... Um, Nothing more was heard of them, but in 1796, McGrady left North Carolina for Kentucky. And you have to, you really have to appreciate what Kentucky was like in 1800, or you don't really understand the aberrations that went on in the Cane Ridge Revival and so on, and how it didn't affect the revival in Kentucky like it would have if it was in the East, Massachusetts, and so on. But the Wikipedia article says many of the socio-religious conditions in Kentucky mirror those of the country in general in post-revolution America. McGrady complained that Kentuckians were worldly people whose conversations were of corn and tobacco or land and stock. The name of Jesus has no charms and it is rarely mentioned unless to be profaned. Indeed, the rush for land represented a change in post-war demographics that were perhaps nowhere as dramatic as in Kentucky. By the way, before 1792, Kentucky was part of Virginia. So Kentucky became a state in 1792. The Methodist preacher Peter Cartwright described this area of Kentucky as where McGrady settled Logan County as Rogues Harbor because many of the people who had committed crimes out east would come out to this area of Kentucky in order to flee justice and punishment. It was a desperate state of society. Murderers, horse thieves, highway robbers, and counterfeiters fled there until they combined and actually formed a majority. The area was primitive in the extreme, and the pioneers lived hard times, lives full of danger, loneliness, and privation. But McGrady was a fearless preacher, and he informed his hearers that they had not left the eternal God behind them. He was as much there on the frontier as he was anywhere. Now, you have to understand uh, something about the Scotch-Irish background of many of the people that settled in Kentucky, the Presbyterians, and this still goes on today. You don't hear a lot about it, but eh, they enjoy a season that could be as much as a week long called a communion season. And a communion season is so much different than our having the Lord's table on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening. They spent a week in preparing for it. You know, many sermons might go before, and it is interesting that the revivals that came to Logan County, Kentucky, and the next year to Bourbon County, Kentucky, all were during one of these, during these communion seasons. But the very fact that uh, Barton W. Stone, who I'll talk about later, Barton Stone, first heard the preaching of McGrady in North Carolina, and it didn't do a lot of good to him because it was so full of the wrath of God, punishment, the severity of the law, and so on. And he was actually converted under hearing the preaching of uh, an associate of McGrady named William Hodge, who was preaching on the love of God. But Barton Stone is an interesting 
character that we have to discuss later, but as you can see, just the very name of Bourbon County tells you a little bit about how rough the background was, and it was interesting that sometimes the pastors weren't actually paid money, they were paid good goods, farm goods, and so on, and some of them even were paid in whiskey, which is interesting because, well, Barton Stone went up to Bourbon County to start a church there, the Cane Ridge Church. He had succeeded a pastor who was dismissed from the pulpit because he was a continual drunkard, and I thought, well, who saw that coming? So in the month of May 1797, McGrady's talking about a revival that came to Logan County. And he said, uh, he preached the doctrines of regeneration, faith, and repentance, which he uniformly preached, and it seemed to call the attention of the people to serious inquiry. During the winter, the question was often proposed to me, is religion a sensible thing? If I were converted, would I feel it and know it? In May, as I said before, the work began. And so, the, um, what's so interesting about the advantages that we have for study in our day compared to a bygone day is so many of the things uh, have been published and put on the internet. And um, as I'll discuss this book later, I had mentioned this book when I was teaching on Asa Hell Nettleton. I looked for that book for over 30 years. I wanted to find some of these rare things on the internet. I can usually find them in about 90 seconds because of uh, I've learned how to search for things. So the remains of um, McGrady have been published and they're on the internet. And he's given an account of the revival of 1800. But just to give you an idea of what this guy's preaching was like, I had found this um, sermon by him, and I'm reading the title of these sermons, and this one really shocked me, The Sinner's Guide to Hell. And he says, well, if sinners are determined to go to hell anyway, we will endeavor to show them the way and that we may do this. We will try to lay the path so plain before you that you cannot miss it, provided you follow our directions and diligence. And I said, well, a sermon like that calls uh, out to be narrated, and I've never, you know, narrating now in my 33rd year, narrated a sermon where I had to back up because I started laughing. It wasn't that the sermon was funny. It was so shocking that this was the method that he would employ in order to get his point across. Well, other people must have thought so, too, because we put that up on the Internet four days ago, and I was looking last night. It's already been viewed over 1,400 times. But the account of the revival in the month of May 1797, which was the spring after I came to this country, the Lord graciously visited the Gasper River congregation. Now, this gives you an idea of the shortage of the pastors in Kentucky. There may have been only an 1827 Presbyterian pastor. So he actually pastored McGrady, three congregations, each named after a river, the Red River, the Muddy River, and the Gasper River. And he had the oversight of three separate congregations, but revival came to the Gasper River congregation, an infant church, and under my charge, a woman who had been a professor in full communion with the church found her old hope false and delusive. She was struck with deep conviction and in a few days was filled with joy and peace and believing. She immediately visited her friends and relatives from house to house and warned them of their danger in a most solemn, faithful manner and pled with them to repent and seek religion. This, as a mean, was accompanied with a divine blessing to the awakening of many. About this time, the ears of all in that congregation seemed to be open to receive the word preached, and almost every sermon was accompanied with the power of God to the awakening of sinners.' 
During the summer, about ten persons in the congregation were brought to Christ. In the fall of the year, a general deadness seemed to creep on apace. Conviction and conversion work in a great measure ceased, and no visible alteration for the better took place until the summer of 1798. So he's given a little detail of what went on before the revival came in 1800. But the year 1800, he said, exceeds all that my eyes ever beheld upon earth. All that I have related is only, as it were, an introduction. Although many souls in these congregations during the three preceding years have been savingly converted and now give living evidences of their union to Christ, yet all that work is only like a few drops before a mighty rain when compared with the wonders of almighty grace that took place in the year 1800. In June, the sacrament was administered at Red River. Remember, I said it was a communion season. This is the greatest time we had ever seen before. On Monday, multitudes were struck down under awful conviction. In Ian Murray's book, Revival and Revivalism, and when I was uh, interviewed on the radio program Iron Sharpens Iron, and you're fielding questions, I was asked about this book. Uh, came out in 1994 is simply astounding the amount of background research that Ian Murray puts into a book and he has two chapters on the Kentucky Revival the purity of the revival itself the good and the beginnings of revivalism the bad and one of the things that was very common and good good pastors who visited there including George Baxter who wrote a letter to Archibald Alexander in the year 1802 these were these were solid men they saw what was going on but it was very common for people to come under conviction that they would fall to the ground as if shot by a bullet to use Ian Murray's words that the the meetings resembled a uh, battlefield where people were lying around under conviction like they had been shot. In June, the sacrament was administered at Red River. This was the greatest time we had ever seen before. On Monday, multitudes were struck down under awful conviction. The cries of the distress filled the whole house. There you might see profane swears and Sabbath breakers pricked to the heart and crying out, what shall we do to be saved? There are frolickers and dancers crying for mercy. There you might see little children of 10, 11, and 12 years of age praying and crying for redemption in the blood of Jesus in agonies of distress. During the sacrament and until the Tuesday following, ten persons we believe were savingly brought home to Christ. In July, the sacrament was administered at Gasper River Congregation. Here multitudes crowded from all parts of the country to see a strange work from the distance of 40, 50, and even 100 miles. Whole families came in their wagons. Between 20 and 30 wagons were brought to the place, loaded with people. Now, admittedly, a place like Kentucky, people aren't coming because they... In all cases here that a revival is going on and they want to partake of it, sometimes it's just out of boredom and they want to see something different. It was to some of them entertainment in those days that brought them into a place like that. It was a hard life that they lived. Uh, I had read one account where men may work as much as 16 hours a day and sometimes women were working in the coal mines as well which really stopped after this revival a lot of purity came as a result of this these revivals including a real push to the abolitionist movement but McGrady says on Friday nothing more appeared during the day than a decent solemnity. On Saturday manners continued in the same way until in the evening two pious women were sitting together conversing about their exercises. Now that's interesting because they were having a conversation about their prayers being answered. They were praying for their children because when the evening had started and McGrady was kind of in despair that maybe God isn't attending this meeting uh, we hardly see anything going on but two of these ladies since they were going home anyway could we share what God has done in our homes and it affected the people around them so much so presently you might have seen sinners lying powerless in every part of the house praying and crying for mercy the Holy Spirit came upon this small congregation. Ministers and private Christians were kept busy during the night conversing with the distressed. This night a goodly number of awakened souls were delivered by sweet believing views of the glory 
fitness and sufficiency of Christ is saved to the uttermost. Amongst these were some little children, a striking proof of the religion of Jesus. Of many instances to which I have been an eyewitness, I shall only mention one, namely a little girl. I stood by her while she lay across her mother's lap almost in despair. I was conversing with her when the first gleam of light broke in upon her mind. She started to her feet, and in ecstasy of joy she cried out, Oh, he is willing, he is willing, he has come, he has come. Quoting another source, William Spear, The Great Revival of 1800. This work was recommended to me because I'm good friends with a guy who uh, is, runs Log College Press. He's also uh, greatly learned in the Puritans, and he's a part of a committee to get the Westminster unpublished documents republished. But he said that I should read William Spear's account, and he said writing later about the Cane Ridge Revival. Some of the scenes witnessed in Kentucky are almost beyond our conception. An eyewitness of a vast meeting at Cane Ridge, and remember this is the revival that's going north, on north near Lexington. Logan County is actually down near Bowling Green, Kentucky, closer, about 60 miles in our day from uh, Nashville. So in 1801, people had come from all quarters of the state, even the distance of 200 miles and from the settlements north of the Ohio, and they described that we arrived upon the ground, and here a scene presented itself to my mind, not only novel and unaccountable, but awful beyond description. A vast crowd supposed by some to have amounted to 25,000 was collected together The noise was like the roar of Niagara. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated by a storm. I counted seven preachers, all preaching at one time. And even then, you know, 25,000 people and seven preachers, they still couldn't reach all of the crowd. And so you had things like the uh, camp meetings that were the result of that because people were coming in their wagons. It was too far for them to go home, and so they just set up camp. So camp meetings, when they began in the early 19th century, started out well. They were really well-intentioned. They were abused later on, but they were a work of necessity as well. And on the right in that picture, you see a tree stump that... Sometimes they had to fell a tree and the preacher, in order to be able to see over the crowd at all, would get up on the stump and preach. So that's where we got the name Stump Preachers. From the biography of J.B. Finley, the shouting, shrieking, praying, and nervous spasms of this vast multitude produced an unearthly and almost terrible spectacle. The religious exercises on the ground were continued from Friday morning until the ensuing Wednesday evening, day and night without intermission. Heavy rains fell during that time, apparently without being noticed by the people, though few were protected by any covering. And I mentioned a letter from George Baxter to Archibald Alexander, and this letter is interesting to me for a number of reasons, because in 1802, though Alexander um, had some notoriety in his day, after all, he was the first professor of Princeton Theological Seminary. When he got this letter, he was only 31, but already had a reputation. And things have changed so much on the internet in the last 10 years that when I taught in Holland on the Great Awakening, so much of the stuff that I was looking for, I had never put my eyes on them, though I knew that they were in existence. But I, And even in this book in 1994, uh, Ian Murray is ha- having to quote secondhand sources including this letter from George Baxter, uh, Archibald Alexander, but in our day, I could trace it back to the first time it was ever published in the Connecticut Evangelical Magazine of 1802, which was actually the second annual of that magazine, which I mentioned last week. But Baxter said, because he was a very, very serious Christian pastor and knew about 
the bad reputation of Kentucky and the people in the area prior to this revival. And he's right now, Alexander, and he says, on my way to Kentucky, I was informed by settlers on the road that the character of Kentucky travelers was entirely changed and that they were now as remarkable for sobriety as they had formerly been for dissoluteness and immorality. And indeed, I found Kentucky to appearance the most moral place I'd ever seen. A profane expression was hardly ever heard. A religious awe seemed to pervade the country with respect to the largeness of their assemblies. It is generally supposed that at many places there were not less than eight, ten, or 12,000 people. At one place called Cane Ridge Meeting House, many are of the opinion that there were not less than 20,000. There were 140 wagons which came loaded with people besides other wheel carriages, and some persons attended who had come the distance of 200 miles. The largeness of these congregations was a considerable inconvenience. They were too numerous to be addressed by any one speaker. I had mentioned Barton W. Stone when he came up to Bourbon County to uh, be the pastor of the Cane Ridge Church. Uh, Even then, he had to pastor two churches as McGrady pastored three. So you have 20,000 or more people coming together in a revival. It says different ministers were obliged to officiate at the same time at different stands. What's remarkable is the conversions of children. The, The part that children took in this revival was a new feature as well as a very remarkable one. A lad named David McCord, some eight or ten years old, professed conversion in the vicinity of Nashville. I'm meeting a playmate near his own age. He said to him, of course we don't talk this way anymore. It's interesting to see this language. Hitherto you and I have been companions, but unless you alter your course, we must be separated hereafter. For I am determined to serve the Lord. The boy was so powerfully affected that he ran home and threw himself on a bed in great distress. He expressed a desire to see David McCord's what affected him, and he was soon brought to his side. The parents of these boys were much amazed to hear them talk in rapturous language of the pardon of sin and salvation through Christ, while each wept profusely. The neighbors were notified to collect for a prayer meeting. The people coming together expressed a desire to hear the boys talk. Each in turn related with tears of joy what God had done, and in truly evangelical language, expressed his dependence on the righteousness of Christ for salvation. The people were affected deeply, and many in the settlement were converted. At a sacramental meeting held near Flemingsburg, Kentucky, in April of 1800, two little girls cried out in great distress during the preaching. They both continued for some time praying and crying for mercy till one of them received a comfortable hope and then turned to the other and cried out, Oh, you little sinner, come to Christ. Take hold of his promise. Trust in him. He is able to save to the uttermost. Oh, I have found peace to my soul. Oh, the precious Savior, come just as you are. He will take away the stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. I can't even hardly imagine eight, ten-year-old kid talking this way. It's just... It's joyful. You can't make yourself any better. Just give up your heart to Christ now. You're not a greater sinner than I. You need not wait another moment. So she continued exhorting until her little companion received a ray from heaven that produced a sudden and sensible change. Then rising with her in her arms, she cried out in a most affecting manner, Oh, here is another star of light. These children were perhaps nine or ten years old. End quote. Last week I had mentioned the book, Lectures on Revival by William Sprague. 1832, and I said in the uh, appendix of that book, Sprague had asked a number of living Presbyterian pastors to furnish letters of revivals that had come to their church. The second letter in there is by Samuel Miller, who taught at Princeton, but Miller was given the um, express duty to talk about things that accompany a revival that are not really good. And so Samuel Miller is talking about camp meetings. 
and how they started he said it is my impression that camp meetings began in the Presbyterian church that they were first adopted from a kind of necessity in a country where houses for public worship were few and of a small size and of course altogether insufficient for receiving the great crowds which collected on particular occasions and who were in a state of mind which prompted them to remain a number of days at the place of meeting those who attended such meetings came prepared to camp out gathering at the prearranged times and places from distances as great as 30 to 40 miles away that was a distance in those days families pitched their tents around a forest clearing where log benches and a rude preaching platform constituted an outward church that remained in almost constant session for three or four days as many as 10,000 to 20,000 people were reported at some meetings. People came partly out of curiosity, partly out of a desire for social contact and festivity, but primarily out of their yearning for religious worship. In such circumstances, and camping in the open air seemed to be unavoidable. But what was begun from necessity was afterwards, in many cases, continued from choice. Camp meetings were found to furnish admirable means for the propagation of strong excitement. The evils, however, to which they naturally led soon diminished their popularity with calm and impartial observers. I've had an opportunity of personally witnessing the effects of such a scene as they appeared among our Methodist brethren. And the general impression which they made upon me was, I acknowledge, by no means favorable to say nothing of the irregularities and abuses which it is difficult, if not impossible, in ordinary cases wholly to avoid, on the skirts and sometimes in the interior of such camps. They have always appeared to me adapted to make religion more an affair of display, of impulse, of noise, and of animal sympathy than of the understanding, the conscience, and the heart. So I need to talk for a moment about Barton Stone, because what started out well in him within a couple of years he started to deny the basic tenets of the Westminster Confession of Faith he was an ordained Presbyterian so he was an ordained Presbyterian minister in 1798 though he was more Arminian than Calvinist in his views and stressed primitive Christianity thought and practice but he was the pastor that God greatly used in the Cane Ridge revival of 1801 he was a preacher at Cane Ridge Church near Paris, Kentucky when it became the center of the great revival and an immense camp meeting the trouble did not take long to develop in McGrady's territory a new Cumberland Presbytery or subgroup was organized in 1801 before long it was in a battle with the Kentucky Synod the next highest administrative body in the hierarchy the specific issue was a licensees of licensing of certain uneducated candidates for the ministry the root question was revivalism. The battle finally went up to the General Assembly for Presbyterians, a sort of combined Congress and Supreme Court. In 1809, the offending revivalistic Presbytery was dissolved. Promptly, most of its congregations banded themselves into separate Cumberland, a separate Cumberland Presbyterian church. Meanwhile, Barton Stone, Richard McNamar, I have uh, McNamara's account of the Kentucky Revival, and he joined a group that was called the Shakers. So there were many things that came out of this revival that I think could have been avoided if these men would have subjected themselves to the proper oversight. And I kept thinking as I'm studying this history that all of the aberrations that came to the revival after the revival were warned about in the book thoughts on the present of revival of religion by jonathan edwards such as lay preaching and exhorting and so on and uh, emotionalism and he has a section in there that may be unequal in the english language called undiscerned spiritual pride asa hell Nettleton was really a student of Edwards at that point, and he avoided many of these aberrations. But as we'll see, 
Barton Stone not so much. So he formed a splinter group known as the New Lights. And the Kentucky Senate, as might have been foreseen, lost little time in putting the New Lights out via heresy proceedings. So they formed an independent Springfield Presbytery. So this is the beginning of what became known as the Restorationist Movement. And the thing they claimed they were trying to restore the church to was a primitive church where you just had the Bible alone and they had no use for creeds and confessions. But in 1804, that presbytery fell apart. Stone and some of his friends joined with others in a new body, shorn of titles and formality, which carried the magnificently simple name of the Christian Church. Later on, Stone went over to the followers of Thomas and Alexander Campbell. And if you know the name Alexander Campbell, he was also a Presbyterian pastor who formed a group that became known as the Disciples of Christ. And they had very little use for confessions and creeds as well. And out of curiosity, I listened to some of the lectures that I found online of what is called the Restorationist Movement, which really is put on by the Church of Christ. And I'm listening to this guy give this lecture, and he's saying, well, uh, why do we need confessions? If your confession teaches less than the Bible teaches, it's dangerous. And if it teaches more than the Bible teaches, it's dangerous. And if it teaches just what the Bible teaches, it's not needed. And I thought, well, why don't you apply that to yourself as an expositional preacher? If your preaching is less than the Bible teaches, it isn't needed. And if it's more than the Bible teaches, it isn't needed. And if it's just what the Bible teaches, why do you engage in any kind of expository preaching? Which, of course, I reject that out of hand. And uh, as I was studying this a little bit more, I remember that Robert L. Dabney, the Presbyterian, the Southern Presbyterian theologian, in his discussions discussed Campbellism, and he goes into quite some depth about how inconsistent these men were. They didn't want creeds or confessions, but they had really written out extensive commentaries themselves, and I think many of the tenets which became heretical such as the idea of baptismal salvation. Baptismal salvation, I'm distinguishing that from baptismal regeneration because they take Mark 16, 16, and they claim unless you are baptized as well as believe, you can't be saved. So he followed on uh, to the teachings of Thomas and Alexander Campbell, and they called themselves the disciples of Christ. Ten years after Cambridge, the score was depressing for Presbyterians. Revivalism had brought on innumerable arguments, split off while whole presbyteries and sent ministers and congregations flying into the arms of at least four other church groups that splintered, and it was a strong indictment that any conservative could have invented to bring against Cambridge or against its western child, the camp meeting. What happens is those who are opponents of revival, they look at these aberrations, they look at these results, and they did it with Jonathan Edwards and his successive followers and well, as well, and say some of these people started to go into Unitarian churches, and therefore the whole revival is suspect, and I think that that's really unfair, because there were good men who were there during the revival who saw the things that were genuine. And I had come across this article because there were something, things that happened during the revival that I just physiologically could not understand called the bends, the jerks, rolling. Uh, We've heard the expression barking up a wrong tree. Well, the proper phrase was barking up the tree. And there's a revival specialist historian J. Edwin Orr, who died probably 1989 or a little after that, who claimed that some of these things were didn't in fact happen, is because 20, 30 years ago when he was doing the research, you couldn't find this material, but I was able to find it and study it. And there was a man, when I first studied this, I didn't know his name, named Dr. Thomas Cleland who wrote a book, I mean an article, a letter to a friend, a pastor friend, that was not intended for publication, but actually uh, 
he thought it could be helpful and it wasn't published till 1834 in the biblical repertory the Princeton Review even though he was there during this revival and his article was called bodily exercises produced by religious excitement the revival of religion under consideration commenced in the southern and western sections of Kentucky or what is generally known by the Green River country the principal instruments were McGrady, William Hodge, Rankin, and McGee. Now there were two McGees, one was Presbyterian and the other was Methodist. And I mention that because it was the Methodist that was storing up some of this emotion. He had been warned by a Presbyterian pastor, please, please don't go through this congregation and stir people up. Nothing good can ensue from that. And at first he listened to the council, but then he's walking through this revival in the year 1800 and he starts shouting things out and then people get stirred by animal sympathy and so on. And just last night I found this book, The Methodist Air, and this gives you an idea how some of these things that you couldn't possibly find 30 or 40 years ago very easily have been reprinted and this was by a Wesleyan Methodist warning the Methodist pastors and there were a number of them during the revival of 1800 because remember you had Francis Asbury if you know anything of that history who was already in Kentucky in 1790 and was greatly used of the Lord and you actually had a um, Eccentric is a way to describe him, pastor named Lorenzo Dow, who was a Methodist. And Lorenzo Dow, I don't have a lot of time to tell you a lot about him. The reason they called him eccentric, the guy was a pretty good preacher. And he observed some of the things that were going on, but they said that he never let a blade touch his beard or his hair, and always wore the same clothes until he could wear them no more, and then somebody that was listening to him would donate another pair of clothing which sometimes didn't fit. But ironically, these men were used during this revival. So McClellan is talking about McGrady and some of the things that went on, and he said, previous to this revival of religion, Kentucky and all this western region was in a state of great coldness and declension. The country was new, and a heterogeneous mass from all quarters had pressed into it. Presbyterians, both clergy and people, were very formal. Sacramental services were very long and often irksome and apparently unedifying or rather uninteresting to the large mass of attendance. I thought it was interesting as I was reading this account that McClellan, excuse me, um, yet Clellan uh, wasn't even ordained to the ministry till after this revival he became a pastor in 1803 but he's very very sober and analytical as he's examining the things that are going on and inasmuch as no neighborhood had a population sufficient to support so many people as assembled on those occasions this gave rise to the plan of camp meetings a grove was selected, a pulpit of wood, or as we generally term it, a stand for the clergy was erected. The multitude who attended to be stationary located themselves with their wagons, carriages, or tents in such places around the stand as their fancy or convenience dictated. The assembly was often so great that secondary stands were erected, the congregation divided so that three or four preachers were discoursing at the same time in different parts of the grove. Here was the commencement of disorder and confusion. The sermon had scarcely commenced when someone or more would become the subject of bodily exercise. This is commonly called the falling exercise, or as it has often been said, such an one was struck down. I cannot better describe this exercise than Dr. McMillan has done in his letter to Pre President Carnahan. It was no unusual thing to see a person so entirely deprived of bodily strength that they would fall from their seats or off their feet and be as unable to help themselves as a newborn child. I have seen some lie in this condition for hours. And there were many accounts of this. They would lie there, you didn't even detect any vital signs for a while, who yet said that they could hear everything that was spoken and felt their minds more composed and more capable of attending to divine things than when their bodies were not thus affected. As far as I could observe, 
The bodily exercises never proceeded but always followed upon the minds being deeply impressed with a sense of some divine truth. Now here's a subject that was so intriguing to me. The jerks. I proceed to relate a case or two respecting the exercise called the jerks. This succeeded, I believe, had its origin in East Tennessee, at least it was, to use a common phrase, commercial phrase, first imported into Kentucky from that quarter. It affected the good and the bad, the aged and the young. It was entirely involuntary, dreaded and hated, and even cursed by some, while it was desired and courted and highly prized by others. It came on something like the hiccup without any premonitory, premonitory symptoms and left the subject equally without any sensible effect. During its prevalence, I made several experiments. Being a young minister and inexperienced, I knew not what to do with it. While preaching, I have, after a smooth and gentle course of expression, suddenly changed my voice and language, expressing something awful and alarming, and instantly some dozen or twenty persons or more would simultaneously be jerked forward where they were sitting with a suppressed noise once or twice, someone like somewhat like the barking of a dog, and so it did either continue or abate according to the tenor or strain of my discourse. An actual case stated to me by William McGrady, a young man, son of an elder, to avoid attending a camp meeting in a neighborhood with a family, feigned himself sick. On the morning of the Sabbath, he continued in bed until the family had all started for the meeting. He being left alone except a few small Blacks, I think they mean slaves. Slavery was very common in Kentucky in those days. When thus alone, he congratulated himself on his success by the deception he had practiced on his parents. He raised up his head and looked all around his room, smiled at the adventure, so he's skipping church. He's, as he supposes, pulled the wool over his eyes of his parents. But lest it might not be complete, lest someone might have occasion to linger or return, and so he be detected of what he's doing, he resumed his clinical position, covered his head, and in a short time directed his thoughts towards the campground. So he's just thinking about what's going on. He knows of this phenomenon called the jerks, and he's just thinking about it. He's playing it through in his mind. He's thinking about certain people that he knows that are at this time in this meeting. He fancied the multitude assembling the services commenced, the bodily exercises, as he had seen them now in operation. He fancied a certain female now in full exercise. Now she's at it. Now she's at it. In a moment, he was taken with the same exercise. The jerks was hurled out of his bed and jerked hither and thither, all around the room, up against the wall, and in every fashion. He had never been affected by bodily exercise before, but now found himself perfectly unmanageable. He had heard it said, and indeed witnessed the fact that praying would cause the jerks to cease. He tried it. The desired effect followed immediately. He felt no more the effects of the exercise than a person does after the hiccup. Now, I had mentioned this book. Uh, This man, Grant Powers, in 1828, and I became aware of this book because it's footnoted in Joseph Tracy's Great Awakening, but it's actually written after the time of the Second Great Awakening, and he's commissioned by the Orange Society Association, of which he is a member, to write this book with this unusual title, Essay Upon the Influence of the Imagination on the Nervous System, Contributing to a False Hope in Religion, Grant Powers, 1828. And of course, the reason this is a first edition is it didn't generate enough interest for there to be a second edition. And then I discovered they were talking about a book, uh, article in the Methodist magazine for 1859 and again this shows how we're able to find these things firsthand. and I printed this right out and it's called Religious Catalepsy and if you want to increase your knowledge of the English language just read these old theological journals from that day and age and he's talking about the effect of animal sympathy and so on So this um, Grant Power says the most extraordinary of these, these effects, these aberrations in the revival were called the rolling exercises of jerks and the barks. The rolling exercises consisted in being cast down in a violent manner, doubled with the head and feet together and rolled over and over like a will or stretched in a prostrate manner, turned swiftly over and over like a dog. And I cannot for the life of me figure out what 
this is or what's going on. And I don't think these people were really that successful either. In fact, the only thing I've ever read in all of my study in it was anything like this is some of the things that Cotton Mather wrote about when he wrote the about the um, preternatural occurrences in New England prior to the Salem witch trials. So they were sometimes driven in this manner through the mud and were sullied from head to foot. Nothing in nature could better represent the jerks than for one to go to another alternately on every side with a piece of red hot iron. Someone standing on one side of you, they hit you with a red hot iron in the side and you turn and then someone gets you on the other side. The exercise commonly began in the head which would fly backward and forward and from side to side with a quick jolt which a person would naturally labor to suppress but in vain. He must necessarily go as he was stimulated whether with a violent dash on the ground and bounce from place to place like a football or hop around with head limbs and trunk twitching and jolting in every direction as if they must inevitably fly asunder sometimes the head would be twitched right and left to a half round so if you watched a head it would turn so quick you almost couldn't follow it but the face appeared as much behind as before even handkerchiefs were bound tight around the head and would be flirted off almost with the first twitch and the hair put into the utmost confusion. This is a great inconvenience. Lorenzo Dow said, I have seen, he says, all denominations of religion exercise with the jerks, gentlemen and lady, black and white, young and old, without exception. I passed a meeting house where I observed the undergrowth had been cut away for a camp meeting. So these people are holding on to these tree saplings so that they would not be affected with this phenomenon. And he observed that where they held on, they kicked up the earth as a horse stamping flies. But I think Dr. Cleland's reflections, and there were seven of them, it, what he saw during this revival is really helpful as I bring this to a close. He says, the first reflection which is suggested by the preceding account is that the physiology of the human system is very imperfectly understood. The second thing that is that an irregular action of the nervous system produces religious excitement, very astonishing. Religious excitement carried to an extreme is always a dangerous thing. Enthusiasm in the counterfeit is a counterfeit of true religion. And in revivals of religion, badly regulated, there may be much extravagance and yet the work in the main be genuine. So though entreated by his revival colleagues to join the Cumberland Presbyterian ministry, McGrady, after the revival, chose to stay among the Presbyterians. So he stayed firm to the end in his convictions. He accepted a censor from the Transylvania Presbytery because of some of the things that they allowed to go on. And he submitted and remained as a faithful preacher to the end along with other revival preachers for his association with con controversial revival practices and doctrines. He was restored as a credentiated Presbyterian minister in 1806. He left Logan County in 1807 and moved to Henderson, Kentucky to a minister to a congregation he had pioneered during the 1800 revivals and he died there in 1817. Barton Stone, on the other hand, died as late as 1844. And I think it's interesting how Ian Murray breaks down this history by that which was good, and there was good, and that which was the beginning of revivalism, which wasn't checked. And that's the whole purpose of this book, to show how historically revivalism crept into the churches. And I think the camp meeting thing went on to be abused. And in our day, you have crusades and so many things that are so foreign to the original intention that some of these men had when they first established camp meetings in the early 1800s. And with that, um, I'll close. Does anybody have anything to add to this? I know it's an awful lot of uh, information, and I've held back so much. I did a question about Jonathan Edwards' wife. She wrote a book about her weakness and fainting spells and her being overcome by the Spirit. Right, but if you uh, read that account, um, I don't think there were. it was really that... Uh,
out of the ordinary, uh, I did uh, read a, a section of that when I was talking in Pilgrim's Progress. In the case of John Flavel as well, remember he had gotten on a horse. Um, he was at an inn. He had paid his uh, fee for the night. He got on a horse. He's going out at a considerable distance and had such a taste of heaven upon earth that uh, he didn't know where he was. He, uh, he didn't know at the time that uh, he was bleeding from his nose and it was covering the horse and that. And even though he didn't know where he was, the horse somehow got him back to the inn and the innkeeper came out to him and said to him, you look terrible. And John Flavel said, I've never been better in my life. So uh, you can't rule out that God can so draw near to us that we have such fellowship with him and so on but um, this seemed to be quite in another category physiologically than what Sarah Edwards went through um, and I've just I, I haven't been able to come up with a good explanation of it I don't know if it's demonic I don't know if you know but better men than me th that were there who study these things I'm saying that they couldn't account for it either but I can't be uh, faithful to this history without at least mentioning this anybody else before I close Al just a, a note on something you said there that people would gather in the pouring rain to hear the gospel if you ever preached out the pouring rain you can't hear yeah you know and, and I can't imagine uh people gathering, you say 20,000, the, the preacher must have had one set of lungs to be able to, <laughs> you, you know, just yelling at somebody out in the pouring rain, you can't hear for 50 yards. And what, what became abused by that is that you had lay preachers, these were just people who, they would wait until they had an opportunity, the sermon would end or something, and they, and they would go through this huge crowd, and they would start exhorting people and so on, but... Uh, Edwards warns that this really can cause problems. People that aren't well grounded have no oversight and so on. And with a crowd like that, it wasn't properly checked. But I, I think I've been here too long, so I'm going to have to close us. Then. Father, we uh, can't explain everything that went on here, but we do know that you did come upon a multitude of people in the early days of this country. And we know that there were conversions, and we know that your Holy Spirit came in their midst, and that's really what we're longing for, that we don't forget that these things have happened, and your manifest presence has been felt in the assemblies and the congregations, and we long for it again. We don't see any other hope for our nation's survival than a genuine revival, and we this is what we ask for, this is what we plead for, in Jesus' name, amen.